Thank you for joining us here at Kent Christian Center here this morning. We are so glad that you are here with us. Here's just a few announcements to let you know what's going on here at the church. All right, coming up May 6th at 7 p.m. is our youth board game night at the Pete's house. If you'd like to come, we just ask that you please bring a bag of chips and a two liter of soda and bring your friends. It's going to be an awesome time together. May 11th at 7 p.m. will be our teddy bear tea. Moms and grandmoms, if you would like to attend, please make sure that you talk to your Impact Girls director as soon as possible. Again, that's going to be on May 11th at 7 p.m. Men, coming up May 14th is a special men's retreat. It's a one-day men's retreat that will be held at Angle Lake Church right across the valley, right up the other hill. It's going to be $15 a piece, and the ages are 16 and up. So if you happen to be 16 or up and you would like to attend, you might be saying to yourself, well, what do I need to do to make sure that I can attend? Well, it's super easy. Right after the service, just head out to the foyer and make sure you put your name down on the sign-up sheet so that we know that you're going. Man, it's going to be a wonderful time and we hope to see you there. Ladies, as usual, we have Ladies Bible Study at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. every Tuesday. Now, both sessions are identical. The reason that we have two is so that you can go to whichever one fits your schedule best. Parents and students, just a heads up, camps are around the corner. I'm not going to be able to remember all of them off the top of my head, but all the pertinent information should be just right about, right about here. They will all be in July and they will cost $215. If you would like to go or you would like your student to go, please see me as soon as possible for junior high and senior high camps or see Mandy for kids camp. And for our voting members here at King Christian Center, we do have a quick reminder about the special business meeting that's coming up on the 15th of May. It'll be right after service. We're going to try to keep it as short as possible. We just need to have a really quick vote on something that has to do with getting a new van for the church. And finally, here's what's going on here at KCC for the rest of the day. At 5 p.m., we'll be having a prayer meeting here at the church in the fellowship hall. And we will also be having current gen at 6 p.m. at my house for those in their 20s or early 30s who want to come and study the Bible. Thank you so much for joining us here at Kent Christian Center today. We are so glad that you came. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, we'll be there most of the time this morning, and depending on what kind of uh, time we have, we'll uh, be over in Colossians, uh, perhaps a little bit also. I, I want to I talk to you today about fixing uh, our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes, you could say it in another way, fixing our hearts on Jesus. Uh, this message today has an intended purpose to help those of you who are perhaps... Uh, experiencing dependency or, uh, or weariness or tiredness. Uh, some, uh, some, I find, many of God's people today are even experiencing bouts of depression. Uh, if you're confused, you, you simply have lost heart. Um, we're not here pointing fingers at anybody. We're, we're the body of Christ. We're here to help our brother or sister up who may be weak today or, or going through the stuff today, amen and to pray with them, and, and we're part of the answer. We are, we are literally Jesus' hands extended, aren't we, to those who are hurting, and, uh, and especially within the body of Christ, we need to be there for one another, to pray with one another, and we need to understand this as I begin the message today, that, that the Holy Spirit, is, as He moves among us, as He was this morning, and this is why it's important. It's important when the Holy Spirit is moving Never become disengaged in what is going on, first of all. Now, now listen to me as a pastor who has been up here in the front and watched congregations for many years now. I've seen services where the Holy Spirit was doing powerful things, maybe up front, maybe even out in the congregation. different. And I, and I see it, 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 never, it never ceases to amaze me. And I see people sitting there, It's going to go on. And, and it, I'll be honest with you, it stuns me. 
Because there's so much that God could do in your life right at that very moment if you will enter in. Listen, we, we, how many of you know, how many of you, you've cried out, you, you say, I want to draw near to the Lord. I, I want to sense the Lord's presence. I want to know that he's near me. And we, we seek for that. And then when he comes near to just ignore him or to be indifferent to him or to, uh, you know, to just say, well, I don't know if I buy this or not. Why don't you just let God touch your life? I get if you let God touch your life, you'll never be the same. You say, I, I don't know if this is real or not. Well, you just, just try it once and see if it isn't real. Amen? We used to sing a song when I was a kid. It's real, it's real, I know it's real. It's Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. Hallelujah, amen? And I know it's real, and many of you know it's real, and I just challenge you, draw near. When, when Jesus is coming near, when the Holy Spirit is coming near, enter in and say, Lord, here I am. I may not understand it all. I don't know what it's all about, but, but Lord, I want you, amen? And listen, he said... If you're asking him for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give you a stone. He's not going to give you something else. Amen. We're, we're, not, we're not in this service sitting here worshiping and talking about anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the baptizer, who is the giver of the Holy Spirit. And so, so listen, church, uh, you're all right. You're in good place. Just trust him. Amen. Trust him to give you those good gifts. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, as I, as I thought about this... Uh, most of what I'll say will be a reminder of what you already know, what you've already heard. Uh, this, this three verses, first three verses of Hebrews 12 have probably been preached on maybe one of those texts that's preached on quite often. I hope, <laughs> I would pray. But uh, it follows the, the Heroes of Faith chapter in chapter 11. If you know what I mean, it, you, you need to go home. If you've never read it, read, read the Heroes of Faith. And those guys did some incredible exploits, powerful exploits. I, I like the first of the chapter better, better than how it wraps up because uh, they all lived. <laughs> but then he names a lot of other of those who did exploits, uh, and, and they never they never saw the prize. They they were actually martyred for their faith. But they they continued on because they they weren't tied down to this current world. But they were looking for a city. Amen. They're looking for a place beyond what anybody in America, anybody in this world has ever known or will ever see. And church, may I just say to you, when you talk about fixing your eyes on Jesus, the old King James says, looking unto Jesus. When you think about that, first of all today, here's what, if you don't get your eyes on him, you're going to have your eyes on the wrong things. And, and you're going to be depressed. I'll guarantee you. I'll get, you're going to be weary. You're going to be desolate. You're going to just think, man, is, is there any hope at all? Because if you look at this world and you try to gain any hope from there, you're not going to get it. I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or whoever it might be, or the Pope himself. They, they can't bring the hope that only Jesus can bring to your heart and your life. So let's read just the first three verses and we'll, we'll talk about them. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, throw off. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a pretty, that's an active word, but it's not, a, it's not just a passive active word. <laughs> I mean, you know, have you ever seen anybody who just, they were cooking and they got too hot, they just ripped their coat off and took it off suddenly, threw it, they're just boiling over. He says, throw it off. Let us throw off everything that hinders, everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. There's a word we all love, isn't it? Perseverance. <laughs> that means work, doesn't it? That means stick to itiveness. That means you don't, you know, you're disciplined. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later if we have time. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Did you know that God has a race marked out for you? And uh, if you're in the palm of his hand, how can you go wrong? <laughs> Doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but he's going to be there with you. He, he hasn't marked out a race for you just to leave you high and dry. The race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Wow. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him, consider Jesus, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I don't have any other person to take you to but Jesus. If you're weary, if you're losing heart, if you're feeling hopeless, He's the only one that can help you. He's the only one that can walk through you through whatever you have to walk through in life, amen. And He can give you a peace in the midst of the trial. He can give you a joy unspeakable and full of glory when you shouldn't have it. The world is amazed by it and they should be amazed by it because they can't give it, they can't explain it even. They may even say, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't be acting like this. Uh, well, it's because you've had your eyes fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on Jesus. So let's look at this for just a few moments. Uh, I, I, just, I just labeled verse number one as, as preparing the way. How I many know sometimes God wants to help us? He wants to do something, but there's some things that we also need to do. Hello? There's sometimes some things that we need to do. And so I, I just this preparing the way in verse 1. First of all, he, 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 he begins by saying, you need to be encouraged because look at the great cloud of witness that has gone before. The, the heroes of faith, first of all, chapter 11 is, is a great cloud of witness that have gone before us, and, and, they, and they stood in there. And they were able to do incredible things as the first martyr, Stephen, even asking, asking that God would not lay the charge of those who were stoning them to them as, as a sin because he wanted them to be saved, even the very ones that were stoning him. How I many know it's hard enough to just uh, get through getting stoned, let alone saying, Lord, don't charge these guys with this crime? Wow. That takes something deeper inside of you than you possess on your own. That takes like something deeper inside of you than man could ever give you. There has to be a mighty God. And there has to be a guy like Stephen who said, I recognize this isn't the final straw. This isn't when I draw my last breath here. This isn't all there is. I'm, it's not all about this. It's all about my heavenly abode. It's all about being with Jesus throughout eternity. And so be encouraged. You see, I've, I've had those encouragers that have gone on before. I have a mom. I have a dad. I, I have those that have encouraged me in life. There's, there's a man that I only, only met, me and Joyce met him uh, uh, for two days. We, we were kind of, we, we heard him speak. And then we spent lunch with him, and we spent probably three or four hours at lunch. And, and yet in that time, uh, he would never know. I don't know if he's even alive today, but Robbie Reisner, he was, a, he was a pow in the Vietnam War. For seven years, for seven years, he is locked up. And, you know, you understand in Vietnam, they're small people, and they put the chains that they use and the cuffs and stuff that they use on you, they really dig into your flesh because we Americans are a little bit heavier weight, generally speaking. And for seven years, and he described how God came to him in those seven years, how God encouraged him when they would, they would strap him up in the, in the stocks and pull his arms out of socket, and when he would lay on that hard concrete bed that he had for a bed, and, and they wouldn't come and clean it out. He had to go to the bathroom there, and it stunk. You can't, you can't even just begin to imagine. And he talked about how he would look out one little, one little stream of light that would come into his cell there, and he'd look out, and he would watch day by day. He'd watch one one blade of grass begin to grow up to see life. But God came to him in that time. God came to him supernaturally in ways that, that he said once he was out and once he was back and once he began to, his wounds began to heal and he was back, he said, God, I, I want to know you in those ways again. And God said, you don't need me in that aspect right now. How I many know oh, if you get to a place that you think you can't go to, God will meet you there. You may not need the strength that he'll offer there. You might, may not need what he'll give to you there in this daily life right now. But when you need it, he will provide it. I am convinced of that. And so keep your eyes on him. Be encouraged in him and those who have gone before. I have a spiritual mom who still is over in Corvallis, Oregon, in, uh, out, out of Dallas, Oregon, actually. And she prays for me. And she, uh, I, I can guarantee you that every day she's praying she's calling my name. I sense those prayers. I thank God for a wife who has been a blessing to me and also has been an encouragement to me. Hallelujah. He who finds a wife findeth a good thing and an encouragement. Praise God. Amen. I thought all the guys would say that. but uh, 
We need those who've gone before who say to us, you can do this. You can get through this. I've been there. I've been where you are. And I tell you, you can get through this. Well, we need to do some things. We need to clear out some rubble, perhaps. I'm not going to stay here long, but he says, throw off everything that hinders. Uh, the old translation says, throw off the weights that do so easily beset you. Throw off the things that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. What are some weights or hindrances? What are some things that may be a hindrance? To, to me, at least, I just for simplicity today, I'd say this to you, that, that some of these hindrances are things that in and of themselves may not be sin. They, they may be things that are, that, uh, to, to me, I think, I think we have a lot of things in this world. They're fun. They're great. God expects us. He's given us these things to enjoy. I believe that we can enjoy our sports. We can enjoy, how I many you know, it's not money that's the, the root of all evil. It's the love of that money that's the root of all evil. And so God does bless us with things and good things, and, and that's what he does. And it's not wrong to, to utilize them, but we, we must not get our eyes on them. We must not get our eyes on those things that he's given to us to the point that if we're afraid we're going to lose them, and then what are we going to do if we lose it all? You still have Jesus. Does he really mean everything? Relationships he's given to us. Uh, uh, things that, uh, that can set us back. Uh, things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, it's not a sin in and of itself. TV, period. But you can watch the wrong things on there, or you can watch too much, or you can be so enamored with something that pretty soon it gets a hold of you, and you no longer are looking to Jesus. You're busy with something else other than Jesus. And so we need to sometimes, you need to examine your life. What is it in your life this morning that might be holding you back from that close relationship that you say you want to have and you tell God you want to have, but you're so enamored with so many other things and you're so busy with so many other things that you don't have time for Him? He wants you to come near. He, he desires you to come near, but He won't make you do so. You have to choose to do so. We've got to confess sin. Sin must be confessed and turned away from, or its hold on you will not be broken. How many know that? If, if we don't confess it and turn away from it, I, now listen to me today. I know that we stumble. I know that we fall at times. And I know sometimes we stumble and fall more than once in the same area. I'm not condoning sin in any way, shape, or form, but I'm simply to say God's grace is sufficient. And He's not just going to cast us off. The devil will say, you've sinned, you've done that twice, you've done that three times, God's forgotten you, now you can't ever find forgiveness for that. He's a liar. I said, the devil's a liar. Because God is a merciful God, and He's a, grace, a God of grace and mercy and loving kindness, and He's patient, amen, He's long-suffering, He's all of those things, but we must confess it, or that sin will get a grip on our lives. See, there's, uh, there's some zebras in the wild, there, and, and wild cape dogs, uh, and what those wild cape dogs do in and of themselves, they can't pull a zebra down, but they'll go and several of them will latch onto him. And once they've latched on, they don't let go. And so as he tries to go along and drag them along, and pretty soon he gets weaker and weaker, and he's bleeding out, and he's weaker until finally he's dead. And they've got their prey. That's, that's what sin will do to you. You say, well, I, 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 I did it and nothing happened, so it must be okay. There's a lot of Christians that say it must be okay. No, it's not okay. And you continue to play with fire and you will get burned. Even tragically, some will get burned to the fact that they'll totally walk away from God at one day and be lost forever and forever. Discipline. Discipline is something you see there. And, and that, that falls into me with that word perseverance there. Uh, discipline of our time and our efforts. Let us run with perseverance, he said there. Let us run with perseverance the race. How many know uh, if you're in a race, it's not a walk? <laughs> Hello? They have walking races, I guess, and that's what they do. Uh, years ago, the best man in my wedding, and Joyce and I, they were overseeing us right after Deshane had been born, and Lynn stayed at the house and was taking care of Deshane. And so Joyce and I and Rod decided we'd go out for a walk. Actually, we were going to go for a jog is what we were going to do because we were much younger then. And we're jogging along for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I began to realize we weren't jogging very fast. 
And so without telling them, I just began to walk along beside them. And I had to walk at a pretty brisk pace. And they're jog, 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 and I'm just walking, you know, casually. And it took them about two or three blocks to finally notice what was going on. Listen, church, we're in a race. We need to step it up. Amen. We need to step up. Amen. Don't just, don't just walk when it requires running. Don't hold back when it requires doing something. Amen. God will help you. God will be there with you. He will help you. And discipline yourself. If you're going to run the race, if you're going to be able to run the race to the end, how many know it takes some disciplines of training? It takes disciplines of training. You, you all know the story. Most everybody here today, whether you're a football fan or not, you know that those guys who are great, some of them come with natural giftings and abilities. How many know nobody came calling me to, to enter into the NFL? I don't know why. They didn't even come to give a college scholarship to me. <laughs> didn't they see my greatness? Yes, you have to have some degree of, of natural talents and abilities the further up the ladder you go. But the tragedy is even some of those who have that talents and a gifting and ability. If you've been reading, you understand what's happening with a guy named Johnny Manziel. He has some natural talents and gifts and ability, and he's been given opportunity after opportunity to exhibit those talents and to enhance those talents and to become better. And yet at this point still, he's throwing it all down because he would rather party and have fun and do other stuff than to work. And he doesn't seem to at this point still understand why people don't understand that. Why can't he just be a party animal and go out and get drunk the night before and party all night and then come to practice the next morning or maybe even play the game the next day? It doesn't work that way, folks. Not for Johnny Manziel, Manziel, not for anybody. Sooner or later, it catches up with you. You must discipline yourself. You must train your body. You don't just get to do what everybody else is doing. Amen? And, and God calls you and God speaks to you. And you say, but, but, but Lord, Lord, oh, three quarters of the people in the church are doing this. They're going to. And he says, but I've called you to do something different. I've called you to step aside, to discipline yourself for this season. Amen. And so I expect, and he wants us to do that. And if we will obey him, if we will bring those disciplines and enter into his disciplines in our life, hallelujah, amen, he will strengthen us, he will empower us, amen, and we won't grow weary in well-doing. What God can do with a like-minded, dedicated, disciplined Christian man or woman would be awesome. Secondly, this morning in verse 2, I want us to look at our aim. <laughs> You can't hit the target if your aim is off. And, and you can't hit the target if you're not looking at all, can you? If you're looking in the wrong direction, you can't hit the target. See, in verse 2, he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The Amplified says it a little bit differently, but it says the same thing. It says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus. And so it's the same thing. But I like that little added emphasis there that it has because if we, if, we are, if we are trying to fix our eyes on Jesus, but we're constantly drawn over here, how many know that's not fixing your eyes on Jesus? He said, you've got to look away from where you have been looking. If you really mean business and you really want to be close to him, look away from all that other stuff. And again, it may be things that aren't bad in and of itself, but it's not going to take you where you need to go. It's not going to empower you and give you the strength that you need to live your life for Christ. It's not going to give you victory in your life. Uh, you'll be a nominal Christian walking through just getting by. Hello. Not because it's not available, but because you haven't fixed your eyes in the right place. You're encumbered with so many other things. What would you say the number one thing is that people's eyes are fixed on today? Anybody have a guess of this, maybe? Huh? Money? Well, that's true. That's true. I, I say our number one thing where our eyes are fixed on are cell phones. Everybody put them away real quick. <laughs> He's going to talk about us now. No, no. Well, some of you are looking at scriptures. on I really believe. And, and if you're looking at something else, shame on you. <laughs> but uh, what, whatever, iPhone, cell phones, uh, media, your computer screen. How many know uh, people have their eyes fixed on them. You go to a restaurant, next time you go to a restaurant, you have to just watch and, and uh, we, we were, Joyce and Amber and I at a restaurant this last week and, and uh, a couple at the table with a couple of kids next behind us, 
the, the guy never, they, their meal came, they ordered their meal came, they ate, he never once put his phone down. I don't know if he was a businessman and had some absolute business had to do, but his family ate all without him while he just stayed on the phone the whole time. There's no conversation. But you see that quite often. People go out on a date and then they both just sit there on their cell phone. Maybe they're texting each other, I don't know. But I, I do believe, church, and this is, you could say, this is just what Les Grease said. I, I believe that we, we, we've got more expanded relationships, and it's been good in some cases. You, you can meet old friends and see old friends that you can't get together necessarily, but you can meet them there. But I believe that, that much of our media that we have today has actually hindered real, real relationship and, and understanding and knowing one another and having an eyeball-to-eyeball, face-to-face conversation. Some people can't, can't do that. They just don't know how to do that because all they've ever looked at is a device. But, but let, let me just think with me. Every kind of media device, we, you know, we, we can't eat. We can't even drive. I had a lady pull out in front of me in Yakima this week and wrecked my car. And, and one of the witnesses said she was distracted by her cell phone. I didn't see that. I didn't know. But, but uh, you know, if you're about to pull out from an intersection with cars coming from two different directions, you probably should put your cell phone down for a minute first and make sure it's clear to go. Make sure it's clear to go. People are dying because of this, literally, literally. And so, you know, and, and you go to meetings. I remember when cell phones first came out, when I went to my first minister's meeting in Roseburg, Oregon, and the first pastor that had a cell phone, everybody was put off and like, for crying out loud, the phone's ringing, we're trying to have a meeting here, and, uh, and he's jumping up. And first of all, he was talking right there with everybody there. Here the guy's trying to preach and share something. He said they're talking on his cell phone. Nowadays, it's, you know, of course you don't have to do it because you text, so it's quiet. But we still, you know, we, we can't do anything with our, we go to meetings, we have our cell phones. We go to bed, we have our cell phones. We watch TV, we're watching cell phones. We try to go to prayer, we have our cell phones. How did we ever live without them? How did their world ever continue? How did God ever receive any prayer at all before, I wonder? I'm going to challenge you. You want to get close to Jesus? You want to see his face? Put down some of your devices. Instead of the first thing you do in the morning, opening up your computer, or picking up your cell phone, and start texting and start doing all this other stuff, first of all, lay it aside, turn it off if necessary, and spend some time with Jesus first and foremost. Now that might be on your device. Your Bible might be there. I understand that. But I don't know how you are. If I have it on or if I have my computer on, I'm tempted to start looking at something else. How many know one thing leads to another thing because there's lots of things that you can see there? And I'm not saying looking at something bad, but it's not going to enhance my prayer life that I was just trying to have. It's going to keep me from drawing close to Him. So fix your eyes. If you really mean to fix your eyes on Jesus, get all the other distractions. And if that's hard for you, I'm sorry, but you need to turn the device off if that's what you have to do. Or put it up on his face on the ground and say, I'm not listening to you, I'm not watching you. I can't even see you. Now back to a day when I first laid eyes on Joyce and my heart went all a flutter. I had a great desire to be near her. Do you know what I'm talking about, guys? Any of you ever had that happen to you? I mean, she was 1,400 miles away, and... Uh, and so I, I, I was making phone calls. Now, now, I know you young teenagers don't understand this, but phone calls used to cost a lot of money. It was long distance to do that kind of stuff. And so I thought, you know what? I, I, I need to get closer. I'd already had one date. How many do you need? You know, I'd had one date with her, and we sat out on the porch and talked till midnight. And, uh, and uh, then I flew back to Seattle. And so with, within a month's time, I came back here, and I, I quit my job. And I, I mean, I, I say quit. That doesn't sound sounds real bad. But I, I knew I had a job I could get in Albuquerque. And so within a month's time, I, I, I quit my job here, and I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I said I'd never go back to New Mexico. I didn't want to go back to New Mexico. I didn't like New Mexico. I liked it out here. But there's something that grabbed a hold of my eyes and grabbed a hold of my heart, amen, that caused me to just do what some would say is pretty foolish things. Ah, oh, what love will do for you or to you. And you know what? I got what I fixed my eyes on. Now, when I got to Albuquerque, she lived 178 miles away in Tucum Carry, and I'd just go see her on weekends. But, but lo and behold, if, if the, if the long-distance calls didn't cost more in Albuquerque than they did all the way from Seattle to New Mexico, that was the craziest thing. I couldn't believe that. So I just had to go see her. 
And you know what I do? I'd may I take advantage of every moment that I could see her. I go there as fast as I possibly could on the weekend, and I would stay after service on Sunday night because those days we went to church. Sometimes, you know, we went three times, and we even got chewed out on a Sunday afternoon because they had a sinkspiration, and, and we left about 30 minutes early. And they said, "Where are you guys going?" And so I'd stay as late Saturday night as I could, as her mom would let me, maybe, and then I'd catch the bus back to Albuquerque. Get there late, early in the morning, early in the morning, maybe go to work and three or four hours later. And man, it was worth it. Because I had my eyes on a prize. Amen. I'm saying all this because she's not here today. She's homesick today. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess she might look at it on, t on the thing. You see, I aim for her because I desired to be near her, to be close to her. I desired for her to become my wife for life. Amen. There, there, was, there was just something. It wasn't just the natural feelings. Those are there. But I believe that God spoke to my heart. It is, is one of those things that I, I don't know. I just felt God said, that's going to be your wife. That's going to be your wife. And so uh, I began to pursue and uh, if we aim for Jesus, because he's the only one that we really love, and he's the only one that can save us, he's the only one that can heal us, he's the only one that can deliver us, he's the only one that can set us free, amen? He's the only one that can give us peace in the midst of the storm and give us hope in the midst of all the destruction and the chaos that's going on. If we will aim for Jesus, he will help us. He's our great God, he's our great shepherd, and in him we find completeness. He's the author, he's the finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, amen? There's no one else we can go to but him. The disciples said when so many were leaving him, when he gave him a hard teaching, where else can we go? Go. You alone have the words of eternal life. And I challenge you today, church, those of you, first of all, who know Christ, maybe everyone here this morning, where else can you go but to Jesus? Where else can you turn? And, and I guarantee you, if you turn to those things, they're not going to help you. They're going to make your life even worse. And so you might as well fix your eyes on Him. You might as well fix your gaze on Him. He's the one that can help you. Now let's just, let's just close with a couple of verses in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 through 10. He says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all you who have not met me personally. My purpose, verse 2, is that you may, and I say to you this, I'm saying this to Kent Christian Center this morning, to you who are here. My purpose is that you may know or be encouraged in heart and united in love so that you may have the full riches and complete understanding in order that you may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the, all the treasures. Uh, hallelujah. In him, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by, by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus, has anybody received Christ Jesus as Lord here? Wow. Christina and a few others. Has anybody here received Christ Jesus as Lord this morning? Hallelujah. So just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. That's that fixing your gaze again. Continue to, your life is hid in Him, the Bible says. Amen. Everything you have, everything you desire is in Him. See that you continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with, with what? Thank, you think God's people who are in Christ would be thankful people? It's supposed to be that way, I guess. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness, everybody say, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness, you have been given fullness in, uh, in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. 
That's why you can look whatever's happening in the world or in your world in the face and say, listen, except God allow, you have no authority over me. That's the way you can say to the devil, devil, you want to discourage me and maybe be despondent and you want to even get me outright depressed, but I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to stay looking at you and hearing your words, but I'm going to turn away from you and I'm going to look to my Jesus who I live in and whom I have my being. And he's going to help me and he's going to strengthen me, amen. He's going to empower me and I'm going to stomp all over you, devil. So you might want to just go ahead and back off now and get out of here before it turns out really bad for you. Colossians chapter 3, the first four verses, and we end here. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Everybody say, I've been raised with Christ. See, when you're baptized into his death, then you are raised into his life. Amen. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts, set your hearts uh, on survivor. Oh, no, no, that's uh, set your hearts on Hollywood. Uh, Set your hearts on Red Robin. Set your hearts on things above. Do, do you grasp what I'm telling you here? You know, see, the Ephesians says that we are seated together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. I believe that's a position even now in a spiritual realm. I may be down here physically, but already God, Jesus says, come on up and join me up here. I, I, wanna, I want you to get a, a view of, I want you to understand that all that's happening around you there, amen, it, it's nothing that I don't know about already. It's nothing I don't know about already. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your minds. Everybody say, get your mind set in the right place. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people, they get their mind in the right place, a lot of things would change. Set your minds on things above. There's that above again. Not on earthly things. Not on those latest, greatest tennis shoes that cost $400 that aren't worth it. Or the latest, greatest style. Listen, young people, I know that you're driven. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing because, you know, they want to write, wear the right thing, look the right way. Or at least they get laughed at or mocked at or something. God says, forget about this world. This world is driven by the wrong things. Be more concerned. Focus in on me. Amen. He says, for you died... And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Wow. Well, I've got to stop. Looking unto Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And uh, as we look to him in close relationship, he will write his law on the fleshly tables of our hearts. You see, if, if, if it doesn't happen that way, you can't, you, can't, you can't walk in obedience to what he has for you. It only is as his law is written on the fleshly tables of your hearts. And you see, see people, people ask me, they say, well, you just do that because, because you're a preacher, because your denomination says that, or, or the people you pastor say, if you're going to be our pastor, you have to do such and such. And I said, no, I live how I live, and I believe honestly, church. And I, and I try to practice my walk with God because it's how the book says. It's what God would have me to do and how God would have me. And, and I want to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus because if I don't, I'll get astray. And I'll begin to hear man's voice and I'll begin to hear man's voice watering it down. Say, well, it's okay, just this time. Or does God really mean, just like he did with Eve, does God really mean what he said? Yes, he does. And he says it because it's for your good. Not because he hates you, not because he wants to make life miserable. He says, I want to make life really good for you. I want you to have the good life. Not what the world defines as the good life, but I want you to have the good life. And so <clears throat> he writes his law on the fleshly tables of our hearts, and the end result will be that we will be like him. And when he comes, we'll be like that tree in Psalms 1. Remember the Psalms 1 tree? That, uh, that uh, was like a, like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And whatever he does prospers, amen, because he's planted by the right source. If you're planted in Jesus, whatever you do will prosper. And then from our text, Hebrews 12, 3, just finish this. It says, consider him. Turn to your neighbor and say, would you at least consider him today? Would you consider him today? He said, consider him who endured such an opposition from sinful men so that, so that, 
you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, the reason I challenge you and I call you to consider Him and to look to Him today is because I can guarantee you if you don't, you'll probably grow weary and lose heart. And I share this message today because I know there's got to be people here who are weary, and that's not to put you down, because there's a lot of God's people that are very weary today. But the Holy Spirit wants to come and touch them as they get their gaze on Jesus once again. I want us to stand together and... <clears throat> the Dutch is going to lead us in... Is it Dutch over here? Yes, he's going to lead us in Mama Dutch. And, uh, and, uh, but I want you to take just a few moments here again and just uh, close your eyes. That's what you need to do to get everything out. Lift your eyes, lift your heads if you need to do that. Let's just listen to the words of the song and let's just say, Lord, here I am. I want my gaze on you this morning. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust. Feet. 